<clears throat> we'll see how it works. Okay, so we're on general relativity part two. And I had that space time video. I don't know if anybody watched it. Just we're gonna, uh, we might talk about light cones a little bit. General, wow, 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 wow. General relativity part two. Part two, part two, part two, part two, part two. Lorenzian transforms today. So let's talk about last time. Last time. Last time we laid down a new coordinate system, or we laid down a coordinate system in a way that some people might not have ever seen. Let's talk about the coordinate system. So I introduced a new set of coordinates like this where we have mu, x to the mu, and I'm kind of writing up here because I want to stick around for a little bit. And in these we had, uh, mu is a Greek letter, and Greek letters run from zero to three. And each of these are coordinates. So what coordinates are they? Well, the first one was ct, but of course we're gonna set c equal to one. And then uh, next is x1, which is equal to x, x2, which is equal to y, and x3 is equal to z. And these are the coordinate systems that we're gonna be using. We also have xi, where we have a Latin letter here. And the Latin letter, oh, also, by the way, if anybody wants these notes, that I'm writing, I always post my notes on Discord, exclamation mark Discord, and you can go and get the, um, the notes for today in the general relativity page. Uh, and then you don't have to write anything down, you can just follow along, you can correct them, you can do whatever you want to it. So then the Latin ones, we just are talking about space time, and I'll also kind of introduce like, I'll use this as a three vector, which means we're just talking about these. So the three vector is just gonna be the Latin symbol and the four vector is going to be the Greek symbol, okay? Or the Greek, uh, the Greek, Greek superscript. Um, so then we also introduced a metric, right? And the metric was uh, used to help us have a nice compact notation. And also, like I said, the metric is going to help us kind of like figure out how space time looks. Okay. And when we had this, so like what this means is you have a four by four matrix, all of the off diagonals are zero and the diagonals look like this. Okay. That's a little shorthand notation for it. Now with this shorthand notation, we could figure out the following Delta S squared was equal to eta mu nu mu nu Delta x to the mu, delta x to the nu. And what this means is basically we're gonna sum over like mu's and nu's so that we get, and basically what we're doing is, is gonna be filling out this matrix so that we get this delta x. And ultimately what this is just gonna look like is this delta s that everybody has seen many times that looks like uh, delta s is equal to, del let me make sure I get it right. I can probably do it on the fly, but I should probably not even try. <clears throat> I already missed my minus sign. <laughs> delta x squared plus delta y squared plus delta z squared. Are we still above chat? Oh, we are just above chat. All right. So with these things, this is what we did last week. And we could figure out, uh, we had this nice notation. And then we have this metric that basically tells us s is any distance in space. Uh, and I mean, in space, I mean this, the certain space that this specifies. It's a specific space. This specifies a specific space, and this is the space. Okay? And uh, the minus sign, though, such a tiny, simplistic little symbol, they don't count for much. Actually, this minus sign m means a lot. <laughs> this minus sign means a lot, lot. And if you didn't watch my video, you should watch the video I have on YouTube about the light cones and relativity. Um, that one, it talks about time-like versus space-like, and this minus sign is the thing that basically tells us what can be time-like, what can be causal, things that are physically allowed to happen versus physically not allowed to happen. With our new convenient notation, we get this, and that's nice, and then, but it might be more helpful to see it like the following, and this is where we're going to start some news. Well, I'll write it down here. Too. Oh, no, I can't chat. Okay. Well, we're going to need it anyway, so let me write it up here. We, we know that like this is, these deltas, they mean like some finite distance, right? But what about infinitesimally small distance? And we want to do, uh, we know that space can sometimes be tricky and it's gonna be the same thing pretty much except now instead of using these uh, 
the uh, Delta S, Delta X, we're gonna be just doing D, D U D X or D X mu and then D X nu. And our metric stays the same, okay? The contravariant metrics I think we'll see next week. Contravariant metric. I think we'll see that next week. Uh, what's the bottom e equation again? That's the space-time interval. Yeah. So this is any this is any um, distance in a certain space, and we talk about Minkowski flat space is what this is. So we talk well, like if you look out in space, and I think someone asked me earlier about going over what the shapes of space again. And what we see is locally flat. So we use like Minkowski space metric to, 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 to cover that. But then like if you go in, like if you have other things that happen like gravity warp space, so you'd want to use a different metric and stuff like that when you're talking about that. But if we're just in the open flat space, this Minkowski metric is how we talk about how things move. Okay. Hey, Admiral, welcome back. Okay, now. Um, let's talk about special relativity. Special relativity has a certain principle, uh, a certain principle of relativity, and these are very important. Uh, and there's a couple of them, but special relativity has one, and we're going to talk about it. Principle, it's going to be very important for today. Principle of relativity. We might see more later in this, uh, this little excursion we're on here. And the principle of relativity is the following, identical. Now pay close attention to this. And remember the inertial frame of reference is what we talked about last week, about how one thing made inertial frames of reference very, part, very, uh, or one thing was like this is a specific parameter that made inertial reference frames what they are. Does anyone remember what that specific parameter is? Uh, so identical experiments carried out in different ref in different inertial reference frames, different inertial reference frames, give identical results. Now this is super important for us, okay? And let me recast it in another way too. This is super important for everybody. Fundamental tenics. This is also called the equivalence principle. Yeah, so there's a bunch of different equivalence principles and principles of relativity. Um, this is one of them. This is the one for special relativity. There's another one that's very similar to it for uh, general relativity. Um, we'll talk, hopefully we'll talk about that one when the time comes. So this is... Uh, this is another way to say that the, the laws of nature, and this is how, this is how Hartle describes it. Let me say how Weinberg describes it. I really like Weinberg's description too. And it's to say that the laws of nature are invariant under a particular group of space-time coordinate transformations called the Renz transformations. Basically like, here, let's, let's do a little experiment, right? Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about physics or a little bit about uh, a transformation. And one of those transformations can just be a translation through space the royal fool welcome to the channel thank you for following and preaching blues i think i missed you guys and duh dan holy smokes dun dun i missed you guys too dun dun welcome to the channel greetings from spain awesome i love to hear it okay so let me ask you guys what changes about this if i were to take away and this is just a translation through space uh and you can do rotations in space as well. We'll do a little bit of both of those, right? What happens if I just take this and start juggling, right? Okay, now, so there's a bunch of physics that uh, goes with the, the juggling, right? You know, we have gravity, trajectories, all that stuff, right? What if I just moved over here and I do the same thing? Okay, it, is there any difference in the physics? In the laws of nature, or is that the same thing? I mean, like, what's different from me doing it's this? It's totally different. It's totally different. <laughs> You're right. No, it's not. <laughs> and what if I do this? What if I turn? Oops. Maybe it is different. Maybe that's why I couldn't handle it. So what if I do this and turn? The laws of physics are the same, right? I can turn. I can move around. I can do one of these. And it doesn't matter, as long as I'm in space, nothing's going to change. Like, I can translate through space, I can rotate in space in certain directions, and things won't change. 
<laughs> Another example of a juggling on a spinning chair. That is different because that's that's not an inertial frame of reference. Exactly. That's a great that's a great point. So Adam Entropy makes a great point. A spinning chain a spinning chair will not have an inertial frame of reference, right? If I try to juggle, there's a, a centripetal force that acts on the balls and they go flying all over the place. Right? Very different. Excellent point, Admiral Entropy. Very, very good. Okay. Uh, but no, like you can do certain things in, in Lorenzian, uh, what did I say? Oh, I said Lorenzian transformations and things and, and the physics is going to remain the same. Okay. So going from a non-rotating frame to a rotating frame would not be a less, would not be a Lorenz transformation, but going, just rotating a frame would be, that's a big difference. Um, welcome on in Kevin. Good to see you. Good to see you. Okay, so let's keep going with this. Uh, and what does that look like? So we could say uh, we have one coordinate system. I think we should probably put, well, I'm going to stick with my notes on this. I have a little bit of Weinberg and a little bit of, of Sean Carroll notes, and they also, they do things a little differently sometimes. Uh, but we can say there's a new coordinate system X after we do some sort of transformation. And what is that transformation? Well, it's going to take the shape of uh, this capital gamma. Lambda? Whoa. No, wait, now I don't know. Is it a lambda or a gamma? I think it's capital lambda. Plus some some other constant that is going to be applied to whichever, whatever coordinate we want to apply to. Capital lambda. I think you're right. Yeah, capital lambda. Um, I thought so. So this is just going to be some coordinate transformation that's going to change the coordinate to something new. So we have this one's x prime with alpha. And these are all dummy va variables, right? Or indices. So it's not going to matter. We want to sum over the same indices. So we want this b to, or this beta to be the same indice, ind index. And then this a can be whatever alpha is or whatnot. And it's just going to be a constant added to whatever. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Uh, so the, the indices don't matter that much right now. They might add or, matter more as we move on, but for right now, they're just dummy indices. So uh, they are going to be in this category here. We want to figure out uh, if there's 0, 1, or 2. And then maybe we could even write this out a little bit. Um, and we will even. So they're constants, and this has this particular role to play. Okay, this is... Uh, this has to be under a certain restraint. And the, the restraint is as follows. If we take this, uh, I want this to be a thing. So let me, well, I can leave it there, I guess. I'll rewrite it when the time comes. Alpha, gamma, and then lambda, beta, delta, multiplied by eta, alpha, Beta. Notice when you're summing over the same indices, you want to make sure that you have a, a contravariant and a covariant index. And we'll be we'll talk a lot more about that next week. Uh, but for now, just notice that these A and B here and A and B down there. That matters a lot. And this is going to equal a gamma delta. Okay? So basically, this is we want to make sure that if we apply this transformation twice to the metric then we're going to get another we're going to get the metric right back like that's the goal you got to get the metric right back okay um all right so there's another way to look at this thing uh last week we saw it as a matrix but what if we looked at it a different way do you guys remember the way that i defined delta before we've seen this before a few times delta ij is equal to and i kind of like this if you guys are a little bit intimidated by matrices i just thought i would let you see an easier way to think about it so you can write this as a tensor. Um, it's usually an identity matrix. Uh, nope, got that wrong. Uh, where we have i is equal to j, it's one, but if i is not equal to j, it's zero. So for this term, this is a, called a, Dirac, or a chronic delta. And it has a, sub, a subscript of i, j. And if i and j are equal, then it's 1. And if i and j are not equal, then it's 0. And we can think of, of this eta, this metric tensor, is kind of like the same thing, right? Except now we have, oh, look at that's our, our non-interference pattern. This is the same thing, except now we have plus 1 for alpha equal to beta uh, equal to 1, 2, 3. So 1, 2, one, two or 3. Minus one if alpha 
if alpha is equal to beta is equal to zero for the time component or is equal to zero if alpha is not equal to beta. So it's just another way to recast this matrix, but some people might find these two things easier to think in and uh, it might be very helpful for the point of our discussion today. And what we can really figure out is that this then, right here, um, so we can write this as a longer form, but I think I'm gonna erase and rewrite it uh, just so we have more time, or more room, excuse me. Yes, if I erase the chalkboard, then we have more time together. And that's ultimately what this is about, right? I wanna spend all of my time with you, Twitch chat. <clears throat> so let's get some stuff up here. Feeling pretty good about our, our uh, coordinates and everything. And now we can talk about this coordinate transformation a little bit, okay? I hope we do it now. I hope I'm not about to like ignore it and put it on the back burner again. But it's this uh, capital lambda alpha beta times x to the beta plus a to the alpha. And we're talking about Lorentz transformations. In a wolf, thank you. In a wolf. Welcome to the channel. Thank you for the follow. It's good to see you. Welcome. Okay. So now we can, so if we, def we defined what this had to be, this had to be the following. I need this definition, so I need to make sure I write it down again. Oh, I see. Um, While I am gone is when you do physics, you monster. We've been doing physics for every minute of the stream, Tyrion, except for the one time that we played a game. Can I play a game with my friends? Man. This guy, you caught me in the trap. I told myself I wouldn't argue with you today. I said, no. I said, no, I would not argue with you. So this was the definition we had before. The um, restriction of this lambda is that if you act on the metric tensor twice, then you have to get the, the, metric, the metric tensor back again, okay? And uh, so when we write this out, this is what the full extended version looks like. If you guys are uncomfortable with tensor still, you can think of it the following way, right? This is gonna be alpha zero, x to the zero, plus, oh, I should look at my notes and you not the board. You are a master, sir. <laughs> um, <laughs> even the game simulated gravity. <laughs> um, yeah, unfortunately, in, uh, in the wolf, I have the speak for uh, subs, um, not to encourage people to sub, but to encourage uh, people who are just going to show up and be crazy to, to be crazy. Um, so I'm sorry about that. But that is just a defense mechanism against the crazy. So we can show how we're going to sum. When I say we're going to sum over like indices, that's what we're doing. See how beta and beta are the same index? So uh, all of these are making up that metric tensor that we had before. Except now the metric, or now the coordinates, I shouldn't say metric tensor. Now the coordinates are being acted on each individual, each individual um, coordinate, right? The, the transformation is acting on each individual coordinate. So we're gonna end up seeing some of these later on and kind of understanding how this is gonna work. Um, all right, so next we're gonna talk about proper time and then we'll come back and discourage. revisit this later. So now we're gonna talk about proper time and then we'll come back and revisit this. I think I can leave this up for a while, but I'm gonna need that for this proper time business. So proper time is an interesting thing. Uh, proper time is, uh, is always measured by the clock carried by an observer along the trajectory. I think that's a very important thing. Sean Carroll talks a lot about proper time. So let's read some of the stuff from him because it's really good. Um, he says, a crucial, a crucial feature of space-time interval is that the proper time between two events measures the time elapsed as seen by an observer moving on the straight path between events, okay? So it's basically like in the inertial frame of reference, how does the clock behave for an observer, okay? And uh, we have the light cones that are in that YouTube video I told you you could watch. And you can have like, a, you know, two events happen, right? So one event here, and then we'll say there's another event here, you know, and like the proper time is basically like the, 
the clock that follows this of world, uh, this um, observer as they travel through the world line, and at each at each point on the world line, there's an event, and at each event, there's a light cone, and you have to stay within the light cone to be time-like. And you guys, you know, like I said, watch the video; it'll show you all of that stuff. And uh, the nice thing about it is that, uh, yeah, so it, it's a visual representation of this stuff. It's really good stuff. Uh, Woozle Effect, welcome to the channel. Thank you for the follow. So proper time is always measured by the by the clock carried by an observer along the trajectory. And uh, it is uh, invariant under Lorenz transformation. What does that mean? That means that the Lorenz transformation will leave the proper time changed always. So let's see how that looks. So what do we define it as? Well, we define it as... The negative version, and we make it negative because of that negative that's in the metric. Remember, we talked about the negative in the metric and how it changed from... Uh, it, it had a big role to play because it told us whether something was space-like, uh, space which is events happening outside the light cone, or whether it was time-like, which is events happening inside the light cone. And the events happening inside the light cone are the ones we want because they're causal, and those are the ones that have that minus sign. So what we do is we define the proper time to get rid of the minus sign, uh, and we'll have the metric tensor again, times dx alpha dx beta, and this is gonna be the proper time. Now what does this mean directly? Well, think about it here. What happens if we have spatial components, the change in the spatial components equal to zero? But anyway, so this is this. So what happens if your spatial components are zero? Your delta x's become zero, right? If the delta's x's are become zero, then the only thing that's left over, so uh, so imagine if you know your delta x's, and we'll say uh, we'll do our three vector. We'll do actually. So let's write it like this. What if uh, delta xi is equal to zero? So all of your spatial components, the change in the spatial components is equal to zero. We can imagine that, ready, watch. I'm still, I haven't moved through space. So because I haven't moved through space, my delta x's are zero, and, my, uh, and then my proper time would just be a measure of, you know, delta t, right, squared. Or dt would be equal to dt. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's it. The, t the proper time is just my clock. I'm not moving through space. Nothing's happening. If you're moving through space, then it's going to be a little different, right? And I'll have to change. Oh, I don't want to erase that. Uh, I think I want to erase this, though. Yeah. So that's just an example of, of what the proper time means for someone who's holding a clock. OK, so can we prove that this is invariant under a, Le a Lorentz transformation? Um, well, let's take a look. So let's look at our new coordinate. So we take a, a coordinate that's being... Uh, Oddly enough, you were not moving, but your nose was. <laughs> Dude, at the speed of light! At the speed of light, baby! Okay. Um, so this... <clears throat> how does this new coordinate system... Because remember, it's a prime. So how does this new coordinate system look after we apply a, a uh, this Lorentz transformation, this thing that we've established to an old coordinate system. I think I have glass in my hand. Um, all right, so let's take a look at this. Can we make sure that the proper time is invariant? So let's look at the new proper time of this. So the proper time, as we defined right here, is going to be equal to minus eta. Ooh, that's a rough eta. Eta alpha beta a d x prime alpha d x prime beta. Okay, so that's good. That's what we defined. Our this has to be, uh, and this. This eta has got to be the same, right? We talked about that too. And then let's now rewrite these in terms of our old un, untransformed coordinate system. So this becomes negative eta, easy out there, alpha, beta. Did you hear that pop, that backfire? Jeez. Alpha, gamma, and we have another capital lambda with beta delta 
and now our new coordinates that are transformed right here. So that's going to be, or the untransformed, I should say, dx gamma dx delta. Okay, so now all, like I said, all we did was just substitute our, our, our old coordinates in the transformation that makes it happen. You did move through space, but we don't perceive. <laughs> there you go. I see what you're saying. I'm doing Calc 1 right now. Next, Mr. Calc 2 and Physics 2. Physics 1, awesome. Cool, cool, cool. Hey, Catherine. How are you? All right. Let's see here. Now, where do we go from here? Well, remember this little rule we have right here that I said is going to be relevant? Let's rewrite that down here. So we're going to replace this and our two transformations. And what are we going to get? We're going to get minus eta. Now the coordinates that are going to last through this, notice how this gamma, delta, gamma, delta. So it's going to be eta, gamma, delta, and uh, times our dx, gamma, dx, delta. And what is this equal to? None other than, ooh, not that the proper time squared of our, or the change in proper time of our original coordinate system. So we know that the way that we've constructed this, we've made certain um, restrictions on this capital lambda, and that has showed us that this proper time that we described as the, the time passing on the clock of the observer um, in the inertial reference frame, and uh, that has to be the same in any in any reference frame under a Lorentz transformation. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So now, can we talk about what this this magical transformation is? And the answer is no. We can't. It's a joke. <clears throat> I hope you liked my joke. We can, of course, talk about it, and we can describe it, and we can make groups with them. They can have cliques. They can be the cool kids in school, and they can push you down and make fun of you. <laughs> I'm not crying. Uh, but we can uh, describe them as a group, and we'll call that group the Lorenz group. Ahem. <clears throat> And <laughs> the Lorentz group, I don't need, I'm not funny, don't encourage me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and that's, and really it's like trying to figure out what's going on with this, uh, this gamma, this, this capital lambda, excuse me, this capital lambda is the thing of, of interest. Now there's an interesting thing with the Lorentz transformations, and the Lorentz transformations, uh, they're the ones that make up the Lorentz group, right? Obviously the, the, the Lorentz, Lorentz group is made up of our, you know, our various forms of, of capital lambda. And there's a similar thing that happens. So there's a large, a large similarity with the rotation group in three dimensions. So the rotation group, also known by the group theorists as O3, is basically a group of operators that you can apply to a system in three dimensions, and it rotates the system. It rotates the system all around. But the difference, <laughs> oh, how the tables have turned. <laughs> um, so the difference with this is now, uh, we want to talk about rotating in three dimensions, but we also want to talk about rotating in that last fourth dimension, the dimension of time. Proper time, back to the future. <laughs> um, so we want to talk about rotating in that uh, in the fourth dimension as well, and this gives us what's called the Lorentz group and a Lorentzian group. And for those uh, and for those uh, group theorists in chat, because I know there's all negative two of you, uh, <clears throat> it's given by the group O three comma one, and then there's certain variations of that, like SO3 comma one, and, and all sorts of stuff. Um, 
and other ones like the Poincaré group, which is extra things. There's, I'm not going to get into that. This week, I might talk about that next week. I haven't decided yet. Um, but can we see some examples of this? Like how, like we, t I told you, like if I'm juggling here versus juggling there, what's the, is there, like, is there a difference? No, the answer is I can juggle in both places. Um, I can't juggle well at all. Try to block off that light there. How'd that work? I think that's pretty good. Um, but I can juggle in either one of the tra uh, other one of the places. If I turned, what's the extra one? I could juggle. Wait, fourth dimension. That's what in this setting time. Time, Terence. Here or there. <laughs> but the laws of physics don't change. Like the laws of physics remain the same, Tropical. You know that. You know that and I know that. The fourth dimension is time. Yep, time. This is four dimensional space time. So let's give a couple examples. How about a rotation in the XY plane? What time is it? I need to grab a, uh, a drink real quick. Oh, it's 537. We're going to finish by 6, I think. Maybe. How am I supposed to know? What am I? A time wizard? <laughs> you mean you can fail miserable at both events? Yeah. It's knowing the signature of the metric you're preserving. Oh. In a waft, usually, in a waft, usually, there is some physics that, like, uh, some other people in chat might do who might have more than four dimensions of space-time. <clears throat> you know who you are. <laughs> and then I have um, dimensions of, of Gaussian stuff, but it's not real. Uh, okay, so uh, let's talk about the rotation in the XY plane. And uh, that can be given by the following version of lambda. Mu not new. We should do group theoretic. We should do group theory. I'm like I'm not good at like speaking it. Like I can tell you what group is what, and that's about the speed of it. Oh, you don't need it. I still don't think you need group theory. <laughs> that's my own personal prejudice. <laughs> but look at if we want to rotate in the x and y axes. Remember that giant uh, thing I probably shouldn't erased. Cosine theta, uh, sine of theta, and zero. Zero minus sine theta, cosine theta, zero, 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 and one. So now the now this transformation is a different four by four uh, a four by four matrix that if we apply it to the metric then it will change the coordinates based off of where these non-1 and non-zero values fit, right? And we're going to do an example of this too, so, so fear not. So that's just one example. Now let's talk about one. So this is just like if you want to take a system and you want to rotate it in the XY plane. So you establish an XY plane and you say let's rotate you know, in the cartwheel or something. You know, that's like a rotation in an XY plane. So that's good. But now let's talk about rotating between the X and the T plane. What? Can we do it? Has ever has such a thing ever been heard of? Um, and yeah, it's actually called a boost. It's very popular in physics. You should know this. Um, let's erase it though, because I want the board. Because this is going to be our proof. We're going to do a little proof with this too. A little fun, a little fun proof. Notice how these are thetas though. They, 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 these thetas are completely depending on how far you want to rotate a system too. That's the angle of rotation. So let's talk about boosts. So you can actually rotate between time and space. This has a very weird consequence. Uh, okay, but let's do this boost thing, right? Let's see. Let's see the rotation between. Uh, that's a really. I mean, that's really capital. That's a super capital. Let's see the capital lambda in action. So we have our mu uh, that's going to take it to a new coordinate system, and here is the rotation between time and space. So we're going to have. A hyperbolic cosine minus a hyperbolic sine, zero, zero, negative hyperbolic sine, cosine, hyperbolic cosine. And now notice because we're using hyperbolics, oops, 
Notice how we're using hyperbolics, so that means we're no longer restricted by the angle here. We can run it from negative infinity to infinity. So now we can run this from negative infinity to infinity, so it's just a straight up, it's a transformation that's not bound periodically by a angle, right? So now let's see what the boost is. So let's take our new coordinate system. So let's suppose we're going to use this uh, rotation from uh, space and time to define a new uh, coordinate system. We'll call it, where do I want to do this calculation, I wonder? I guess we'll do it right here, and we'll see what happens. Uh, t prime is going to equal t hyperbolic cosine phi minus x times hyperbolic sine phi. Now, if you're wondering how we got here, remember that the, uh, the definition for the coordinate change after a transformation is, here's the new coordinates. So it's going to be alpha. So this is going to include the time coordinate. It's going to include all the coordinates. This is a Greek letter, which means it runs from 0 to 3. Gamma, beta, alpha, x to the beta, plus some other constant, which we'll probably be ignoring for the most part. <clears throat> um, <laughs> I'm trying to black out the sun a little more. Um, all right, so let's have our other, oh, look, it, it's creeping up still. Sun, stop setting for a second. Can you just not set for a little bit here? Man, you're so rude. So we got a hyperbolic sine. For the x-coordinate now, we have hyperbolic sine plus x hyperbolic cosine phi. And then the other ones, now the other ones are not going to matter too much. Uh, I'm not worried about the y and the x. They're not being, they're not being, uh, they're just going to be like, they're going to be the following. It's just going to be y prime is equal to y and z prime is equal to z. So you can see how this is going to actually transform the coordinates so that if we were to multiply the vector, so suppose you have this as like a vector and you multiply it, you're going to end up with these system of equations that you have to solve. Okay? Now let's suppose that this is going to be, let's take a look at what happens when we have x prime is equal to zero. Okay, so x prime is just a coordinate. We're wanting to look what the coordinate system does. So let's set x prime equal to zero. That means that we're going to get the following. We're going to happen, we're going to look at the, the, we're looking at the origin of this new coordinate system is really what we're doing. And what do we get? We're going to get t times the hyperbolic sine of phi is equal to x times the hyperbolic cosine of phi. Why do I always do that? of phi. And then what happens? Well, let's keep writing. And we'll notice that x over t is equal to velocity, which is equal to, uh, <clears throat> so this is going to be, so x divided by t, so we're going to move this t over here, this cosine over here, and we'll get hyperbolic tangent of phi. So this means that our parameter phi, basically how we're rotating stuff. <laughs> I know, Admiral. He has a different language completely. It's a completely different language. I love it, though. I love it, love it, love it. Um, so then we're going to come up here now. And then that means that, the, uh, that phi is equal to the hyperbolic tangent of the velocity, the arc, arc hyperbolic tangent, OK, or the inverse. So let's go back to our original one right here, and let's plug some stuff in and take a look and see what happens. Um, so if we let t prime be equal to t hyperbolic cosine of hyperbolic tangent inverse of v plus or minus, excuse me, x hyperbolic sine hyperbolic tangent inverse of v. So there is our, I think I have too many parentheses, but whatever. Try to knock one of those off. Okay. And then we have our, that's t prime. So x prime is going to be given by negative t hyperbolic sine of hyperbolic tangent inverse uh, plus x hyperbolic cosine of hyperbolic tan, hyperbolic tangent 
inverse of v. Now, if you don't know these relations, you can look them up pretty easily. There's all sorts of trig tables out there that kind of tell you what those are. And what are they? Well, they're none other than the following. Is that the chat? Cut that. Oh, no, above chat again. Um, are you ready for this? This is the, this is the clincher. This is the key. T prime is then equal to T times 1 over the square root of 1 minus V squared <coughs> minus X times X divided by the square root of 1 minus X squared, uh, V squared. Oh, my notes are wrong. This is supposed to be V squared. If you're following along my notes, please change that. All of these are supposed to be V squared. Excuse me, I, I'm, I wrote the wrong thing down. Double check the notes. Really botched that one up now, didn't you there, Eric? They're not even in the book. It's not even in the textbook. And then T prime is given by, or X prime, excuse me, is given by T, negative T times X divided by the square root of one minus V squared, uh, plus X one minus the square root of one minus V squared. However, this should start to look very familiar to you guys. Uh, it was not a V, it was a Dio. <laughs> it was Ideo. Huh. Um, so the... <clears throat> doop. Okay, so, these v, so th this should start to look familiar. Ready? Here comes the magic. Let this arbitrary value of gamma equal 1 over the square root of 1 minus V squared. Uh, does anyone see it now? Does anyone see it yet? That means our coordinate transformations look the following. T prime is equal to gamma times T minus VX. X prime is equal to gamma times X minus VT. Has anyone seen that before? <laughs> Did the mods delete messages? I didn't even see that. Usually they tell me. So has anyone seen this before? This is the Lorentz transformation coordinates. Giorno household. <laughs> I mean, what are you guys talking about? Pizza? I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> what is this? Um, listen. The Lorentz transformation. Huh? Nobody's seen this before? This is awesome. This is like a complete, I've never seen this transformation, but using hyperbolic cosines and tangents and actually rotating through time and space. If we rotate through time and space at this coordinate, we get a velocity. Okay. We realize that now this coordinate system, this X prime and T prime is in motion relative to the original coordinate system. <laughs> Justin, I know Justin, right? <laughs> oh, geez. Well, thanks, Justin. I appreciate it. <laughs> things the Transformers do. <laughs> yeah, but what does it look like in real life? In real life, it just looks like two... It's like uh, you're going through space. In real life, it looks like this. You're going through space, okay? And uh, you're going through space, and... You don't know you're going through space because you're, you're, you're in your own inertial reference frame. So things don't look like they're moving, right? Everything looks stationary. Well, then you see another spaceship start coming at you. And as, as you're traveling by, you're like, duh, 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 duh. the other spaceship starts coming by you. And you don't know you're moving because you're in your own inertial reference frame. You have no reason to think that you're moving. The other spaceship comes flying by you, all right? It looks like they're moving. What does this tell us about their motion? It tells us that not only are their times going to look different, and we're going to talk about that in a second, that's called time dilation, but their distance in X is going to look different too. The, the, the direction that they're traveling is going to have a different look as well. Remember, the speed of light is 1, or else it would show up here, I think. If you really drive past a box of electrons, it looks shorter by a factor, yeah. People, speed is relative, yep. 
but uh, what Bluetooth is everybody using? <laughs> Don't know what Bluetooth is, but everybody uses it. <laughs> Wait, what? Because it's moving the same speed as me, my stuff around me, I mean. Yeah, so this is really close to, like, the, the, the factor doesn't start showing up until you get close to the speed of light. So, like, the speed of light is set to 1, so these are in units of speed of light. So you have to be really close to the speed of light um, in order to, before this stuff starts getting used to it. Uh, you see to see it. If you drive really fast past a box of electrons, its energy density goes up by 2 of that same factor. Are you, that's pretty interesting. Well, that's just, I mean, that we have relativistic effects for that, too, right? Uh... Does he talk about that in the in the beginning of Weinberg or Carroll? Because I know they talk about the Maxwell equations. I wonder if they talk about that, actually. Okay, we got one more thing to do, which is time dilation. So we're actually going to talk about how this is supposed to look, right? And then we'll be done for the day. I swear, I'm just going to throw this on YouTube unedited so that everybody can see how fa how terribly I failed at that. <laughs> how nobody was as excited as me <laughs> to get the Lorenz transformations out of that <laughs> and let YouTube decide what to do with me. I leave it in YouTube's able hands. <clears throat> uh... Gothish the first, welcome to the channel. Thank you for the follow. So lastly, we're going to talk about time dilation with our new idea of how this is all working. Dilation. And it's going to look like this, right? So we're going to say, consider, so uh, we're going to be using our Latin. So we're going to have a three vector that's going to be look like the infinitesimally small form is going to look like that. It's going to be a three vector, not a four vector. Consider a stationary observer. So now we're talking about Mindalator. He's chilling in the, uh, he's, ch he's a gray tooth. <laughs> he's, uh, so we're talking about Mindalator. He's chilling in his spaceship. Oh, hi, welcome, welcome. Uh, and his, in his spaceship, he, uh, is, is not moving. It is stationary in his, in his self. He's, you know, it's his own inertial frame. So we're going to saw in his re frame of reference, he's not moving. Okay. So that means that, and like we said earlier, that this D, x this three vector is equal to zero all of the things everything that's in it is going to be equal to zero and dt is going to equal some delta t okay so it's going to be like his change in time is going to be something that he can measure right like there's a, a an easy way to measure it and he can measure it and that's fine okay so his clock is just ticking forward one second per second whatever uh but then consider oh so we can talk about his proper time too right so his proper time Uh, it's going to equal, and notice it's not squared because I'm going to take the square root of this, the change, so it's going to be like the distance, just like we had it defined before, of the time you the time uh, parameter minus the uh, the three vector parameter, all squared and one and a half. We've got to do our, our um, Pythagorean theorem to figure out a distance, right? That's the thing we've been talking about. And all this is going to equal delta t, right? There's going to be no spatial components, none of them. No spatial components. Okay. <clears throat> Straight lambent. Now, this is the fun part. So then, uh, Mindalator starts seeing uh, off in the distance a spaceship come towards him and start to fly towards him and past him. And like I said, there's going to be, we're going to do just, we're, we've set the speed of light equal to one. If you want to know some actual real effects, you'd have to include it in meters per second and then do all that stuff. But you can follow it through the equations pretty easily. Uh, just attach it to the, C, the T's before you get going. Um, now get. Uh, so now we're going to consider the moving observer, okay? So my delator is holding a clock, okay? He's like Flava Flav. He's got a big clock. He likes to watch it. That's all. He, I mean, he's sitting in a spaceship by himself in the middle of space. What else is he going to do? So he's got the Flava Flav clock, and he's just watching it. Well, then, you know, somebody else has a big clock, too, and they're holding it out the window as they drive by, and they're like, look at my clock as they drive by, right? And so my later looks out his window, and he can see the clock moving through space. So now we're going to have two clocks. I'll find something to do. <laughs> is there a ray of light across the room? There is. 
And it's like, the sun keeps setting because it has no manners. So I have to keep changing where my garage door is at. Um, <clears throat> all right. <laughs> you rotten son. Uh, all right, so then we know that there's some, we can write some velocity that uh, the uh, uh, minolators, uh, our friend who's trying to show him the clock is, is writing. And we'll write it the following way, right? It might be a little bit weird, but the, the, the friend is gonna be moving in a frame of reference, so he's gonna have a different coordinate system, okay? He's gonna have a different inertial coordinate system. We just talked about that, like rotating into that and how it'd be a different coordinate system. Uh, and that manifests itself as a velocity. And that's gonna be equal to velocity of dt, like that, right? Which, I mean, you guys can see this is just dx over dt is equal to v, right? The velocity is equal to dx over dt, okay? Now, uh, so this is what observer two sees. Observer two sees dt squared, which is equal to, oh, uh, not squared, prime. Prime, yeah, prime. Uh, so that's another mistake in the notes you gotta fix. It's d, I wrote d tau squared, it's supposed to be d tau prime. I got my primes and my twos mixed up. Starch face. Welcome. Thank you for the follow. Welcome to the channel. Uh, okay, so now he sees this d tau prime. And what is going on with that? Well, that's going to equal dt prime squared minus our three vector squared, which two of the components are going to be zero because he's only moving in one direction. So it's really just going to be the one component of x. And that's going to be equal to delta tau. Okay, so a new delta tau. Oh, no, no, I'm, excuse me, excuse me. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. I, I read the wrong part of the notes. That's going to be equal to what? Well, we have dt prime here. So it's going to be one. We're going to pull that out. And then we also have a v squared from here. Because we're going to x squared. x squared is going to equal v times dt squared. So when we square this, we're going to square this and square this. And then we're going to pull out the, uh, the dt prime. Okay. So we have a new coordinate system. <clears throat> but we know that under any Lorentz transformation, d tau prime has to be equal to d tau. What does that mean? Well, d tau is equal to, oops, that means d tau is equal to delta t. And d tau prime is equal to 1 minus v squared over 1 half dt prime. So that means that dt prime has to equal delta t divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared, which equals gamma delta t. So this new time coordinate, basically, as Mindelator looks at the other observer's clock, it's not going to be ticking at just delta t. No, 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 no. It's not ticking at one second per second anymore. Now it's ticking at a new time. It is no longer one second per second, depending on how fast it goes. And like I said, if you want to actually do this, you can look up the Lorentz factor, which I think is v squared over c squared. Someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the correct, if you don't set it to equal to one, it's one over the square root of one minus v over c uh, squared. They're both squared. Uh, and so if you want to do like what, it would, what the actual calculations would be, you can start plugging in some numbers. You, you could do like 0.1 the speed of light or something like that. Um, hoping for knowledge. <laughs> I read it and I was just like, is that, a, is that a sage? Ah, it's a sage emote. We love sage here. <clears throat> Thanks for coming. Good to have you. From your, my perspective only though. Yes, from your reference frame only. Looking at his clock, it's going to do that. And then he could look back at your clock and do the same thing. Very interesting stuff to think about. So that's it, guys. That is general relativity part two. We've covered a lot. We did all sorts of Lorenz transformations, talked about the Lorenz group. We saw what it did. It shows us that <clears throat> if you rotate, there's a way to talk about rotating in space and time. And that rotation, let me open up my door again, that rotation in space and time manifests itself as a velocity. That velocity 
then has other consequences like for instance it shows us some rel some some i don't know what does it show us it shows us <clears throat> uh that the the clocks tick off for different observers and different reference frames what do you guys think